Hello everyone, welcome to part three of our uh, section on partial differential equations. Until now we have seen um, why they are interesting. Um, you know, physics systems can be modeled by these where we have distributed quantities, systems from chemistry as well, finance also. So all sorts of systems where we have more than one free variable. And then we saw, okay, the heat equation can be derived using conservation laws. Very similar to how Newton's law can be used to derive ODEs for mechanics systems, we, we ended up with the heat equation. And so what we will see now is how to solve this numerically. And so this box here might look very frightening, but it's actually the standard Taylor series expansion in two directions. And I will go into this in, in detail in a second. And you can see that this is, you know, the standard definition that you see here. Um, and here it's written out for two particular situations and I will tell you all about it in a minute and we will see that actually even though this looks um, rather irritating it can be used in a very convenient way to derive um, schemes to get rid of the partial derivatives in space. Right? So the problem that we had is, and so we have seen this before, I will get back to this also um, once we have the scheme is that the heat equation was derived in uh, of this form so the partial derivative of the temperature with respect to time is equal to lambda which is the, the material constants if you wish times the second derivative of the temperature with respect to the spatial coordinate. Okay so we have a problem we have dependencies on space and time. And what we would like to do is, we would like to, uh, similar to the ODE setting, derive a numerical scheme that beginning at time zero, T zero, um, we start with an initial temperature distribution and we can iteratively update on a computer the temperature distribution step by step so that we can move forward in time. And so what we need to do for this is we need to get rid of these derivatives on the right hand side, or more specifically, we need some method of using um, a finite number of points, a grid, to be able to implement this in a computer. Right? As we said, one of the specifics of PDEs that makes them hard is that the temperature distribution, T, at every given point in time still consists of infinitely many points where you can have a temperature. Right? It's a continuum. So what we're going to do is, we're going to introduce a numerical grid Right, this is again the 1D heat equation here. We started at zero and had this, this rod of length L. And we are now not interested in the temperature distribution everywhere, but we will be interested in a temperature distribution at n plus two points. Why n plus two? We will have n points in the interior and then we will have one point at the left boundary and one point at the right boundary. Right, I said boundary conditions are very, very important and need to be treated individually. Um, but this is the setup we are going to have and then we will say okay let's not care about the temperature everywhere but let's care about the temperature on this finite number of grid points and this is what we're going to use to get an update rule and as you can imagine if the grid size this delta s goes smaller and smaller so the grid consists of more and more points the n becomes larger and larger this approaches the true continuous solution right? we're not going to discuss the specifics it's a lot of research going on in the area of, let's say, convergence of these numerical schemes towards the analytical solution, but we are going to treat only the very basics here. So, the question is now, I said we are going to, you know, discretize this. Infinitely many points become n points in the interior, and if you have only these n points, then what you will see is, actually, we have an ODE, right? We have a time derivative, which is equal to a right-hand side that we need to figure out now, but if the t consists of a finite number of entries, a vector, so to say, uh, determined at these grid points, then we have an ordinary differential equation, and then we can use what we have learned earlier, right? Explicit Euler, implicit Euler, runge kutta schemes, and so on. So the trick, really, in numerics is let's eliminate the spatial derivative, or let's approximate it on a finite grid. And then we are in the ODE setting and for the time integration we can use what we have learned earlier. And so this video is all about this partial discretization in space. Right, and this is where the Taylor series comes in very handy. So think about this, we have now the J index is now the temperature, I've omitted the time 
dependency for now and not to make it even more messy. But the Taylor series expansion is always, you know, if you want to evaluate a function at a point x and you only have the value at a point a, then you can derive this series, right? You evaluate f a and not only the function at a, but its first derivative, second derivative, third derivative, and so on. And so this gives you an approximation for the function value at a consecutive point. And so this is what we are doing here, right? We are considering grid point number j and j plus 1, so the right neighbor. And we can use the Taylor series expansion, and I stopped here with these dots, to say, okay, the temperature at grid point j plus 1 is, using a Taylor series expansion, the temperature at grid point j plus first derivative times delta s. So this is, um, the n is 1 here, divided by 1 faculty, so nothing times delta s is the difference between the jth and the j plus 1th point. So this is the, the, the grid size. Plus, um, oh, I see, I did forget a delta s squared here. Delta s squared here. In these points, so you see times a half second derivative delta s squared plus 1 over 3 faculty, which is 1 over 6, third derivative times delta s 3, fourth order, fifth order, sixth order, and so on. And so what I've done now is I can do the very same thing using tj again, the temperature at node j, but not going to the right, but going to the left. And so the only thing that changes really is that I am not considering delta s because I go delta s to the right, but I need to consider minus delta s because I'm going delta s to the left. Right? And so in the first order term, this becomes a minus, minus delta s. In the second order term, this is minus delta s to the power of 2, so it's a plus again. In the third order term, it's minus delta s to the power of 3, so here I have a difference, okay? And so you see, here it's a series of plus terms only, here it's a series of alternating the minus terms and, and plus terms. Okay, so you see now, this doesn't look so frightening anymore, I hope, and now we can see, okay, what are we interested in? We are interested in the first order derivative, maybe. In this case, we will be interested in the second order derivative. So maybe we can use these two combine these two and create a scheme that gives us a nice intuition what this derivative looks like. So even though we're not going to need it here, let's start with the first order derivative. And what I can do now is I can say, okay, let's take the Taylor series expansion number one, so the first row here, and subtract from it the Taylor series expansion number two. Okay, and so you see if I subtract this from this, what I get is tj plus 1 minus tj minus 1. So this is subtracting the left-hand side equal, and now I need to subtract the right-hand sides. And I see tj minus tj, so this one vanishes. I see this term minus this term, so it's the same term, opposite sign. So if I subtract this one, I get 2 times this term. So the first term that really is of importance is 2 times delta s times the first derivative. Now, if I subtract the second order term, this and this, these are again of the same size, uh, the, the, the same entries and the same signs. So subtracting them, they vanish. Here, opposite signs, they still remain. Okay, so I'm not going to write this out. What's really important is the order of this delta s. So what I have is I have this term plus I have a term that is on the order of delta s3, right? Remember what I said in the beginning, what we're going to consider is if the s shrinks, um, this one will go to zero with third order. So it's basically negligible over this if the delta s is small enough. And so what you see now is, aha, uh -huh, it's very nice, right? We have this first order derivative defined using grid points. So all I need to do now is I need to solve this for this term here, okay? So what I can say is delta tj divided, or the partial derivative with respect to the spatial coordinate is tj plus 1 minus tj minus 1 divided by 2 delta s. And now I have divided both sides by delta s, which means this term becomes a term of order 2, right? 
still looking good, okay? So what I've done now is I have this first order partial derivative with respect to space, and I've eliminated it because I can just use the node values, left and right of my jth node, and divide by 2 delta s, so this is again a finite difference approximation if you wish, and you see I get a nice approximation. And I can do the same thing by adding these two equations, this is what I'm going to need for, for my heat equation, okay? So I'm going to be a bit quicker about this now, um, because you can imagine how it goes. So if I add these two, then all of a sudden all terms with opposite signs vanish. Uh, you see, this one will vanish if I add them up, these terms will vanish if I add them up, and these terms with identical signs are just, you know, multiplied by 2. So what I will get is tj plus 1 plus tj minus 1 is equal to 2 times tj plus, here is second order derivative, plus this one vanishes, plus a fourth order term. Okay, so what I will have in the end, and now, you know, I can write it like this, and then for a second term, what I, or if I arrange for it, you see, subtracting this, the first order derivative drops out. The lowest derivative I have is the second order derivative. So what I'm going to get in the end is the second derivative with respect to space is, right, and you can calculate this if you wish, but this is really by adding these up and then solving for, for this term. divided by delta s squared, right, I will divide by this delta s squared term that I forgot in the beginning, plus an order term, again, delta s squared. All right, so even though I did not tell you how to do it exactly, I guess there's an easy enough recipe how to get this. And so you see, now I can replace in my heat equation the derivative with respect to space. I just need to insert this and I can solve instead of for this t, for a solution on a grid. So what I'm going to introduce is, on the grid, I have, let's say, I'm calling this quantity t hat, which is a vector t of s1, t of s2, till t of sn. Okay, so the t hat means it's a discretized version. In fact, I have my temperature at n distinct locations. These are my grid nodes. And for each of these entries, tj, I can now replace the derivative by my finite difference approximation. So what I get is t hat and the jth node, and then the time derivative um, is given, and I'm omitting or I'm not writing the time dependency, right? This is obviously tj of time, right? It's still, or maybe let's write it to make it more obvious. I have discretized this in space. I have not discretized this in time until now. So in the jth node, what I get is this. And for the left-hand side, I have now lambda times the second order derivative for which I can use this approximation here. So it's tj plus one of time minus two times t j, so the jth entry of my discrete version, plus tj minus 1 of time, divided by delta s squared. All right, and so what you see is we have an ODE, right? I have j, the jth node has this rule, and I can write this down for n of these, so I have n ordinary differential equations that are in fact coupled. Uh, so, right, if I do not use the index, but I write it in terms of the full vector, what I'm going to get is a description of this form. I have this lambda divided by delta s squared. And what I'm getting now is this band structure, right? And let me use a color scheme because you will see in a second why this is not entirely correct what I'm writing here, but I will tell you why it's different. Um, so for the first point, you have the node left, minus two times the node itself, plus the node right. And for the second one, you have one here, minus two here, one here. So uh, you add j1, subtract two times j2, add j3, uh, this dish three, and so on. So what you get is this sort of 
tridiagonal structure um, of this form and this one I'm again denoting in blue because I'm going to talk about this in a, in a very short moment. Okay, so what I have is this tree diagonal structure, right? A, a diagonal and these off diagonals. And so what you see is, oh, wait, wait, what I get now is t hat of t. So again, we are in the setting, the right-hand side is just a linear system. So I have an ODE, um, just a big one, right? Because this n can grow very large. The problem is now, why have I written these in blue? Um, the problem with these boundary conditions. So in fact, really, um, this equation only holds for the internal nodes, right? So for one until n. And so the node on the left, the zeroth node, or the n plus one node, is not part of the state that can evolve over time, right? The PDE is only defined in the interior. In the boundary, I need to be careful. So this one cannot be used here. In fact, I have a matrix of this structure. Same here. I have a matrix of this structure. Um, where I have this tree diagonal structure. And if you see, this is now also a square matrix, right? You have the minus two on the diagonal and one and one, um, excuse me, this should be a plus one on the off diagonal. But still, what you have is this form of uh, consideration. What you need to add now in order to make it correct again is an additional term that considers the boundary conditions, right? So what you will have is plus a vector b, right, so which is the node at the very top. So this is a zero vector almost everywhere, only you have a component for the first equation and you have an entry for the last equation that accounts for, you know, these nodes not having a left neighbor or not having a right neighbor in the interior. So this is very important. In the interior, we can easily do what we've done here. Again, the boundary conditions need specific treatment. But we will talk about this in a bit more detail in the next video and we will also, when we look at the programming code or the, 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 the Julia code, we will see that this can quite easily be solved. And with this, thanks for your attention and see you in the next video.